struck myself by a quotation uh, that Professor Johnson includes on her Drake University webpage um, because it struck me as so very different from the attitude expressed by some law professors I, I have encountered and who taught classes I took myself. So Johnson quotes Charles Ham Hamilton Houston who said, a lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite on society. <laughs> um, I appreciated this because it enables me to think of a, you know, a certain law professor of my own as a, well, in different terms than I might otherwise. <laughs> but in her own voice, Professor Johnson adds, I aim to create a positive impact on society through my teaching and scholarship and my travels to countries like South Africa and Haiti. I've seen incredible impact that access or lack of access to resources, education, and the legal system can have on various groups of people. As a professor, I hope to motivate future lawyers to think critically about the world in which they live and how to use the law to improve that world. Um, so we're very fortunate that she is so near us at Drake University, and we're very fortunate to have from her today a presentation on indigenous knowledge and intellectual property. And um, I guess you're up. Thank you very much, Shanti. Thanks. Okay, so there are some law professors in the room. That social parasite quote doesn't apply to any of you. My colleagues, you're all wonderful professors. No social, <laughs> no social parasites in the room. So Dr. Streifer said something really interesting. At the, well, the whole presentation was quite interesting. But at the end, he said he was going to punt because he was the bioethicist, some of the legal questions. So he's the punter. I'm the receiver. <laughs> I happen to be the lawyer. Uh, I don't know if this will be like a 100-yard return or 50 or whatever, but I'll raise lots and lots of interesting questions, specifically about some of the questions that he raised and a few others. So before I start talking specifically about the nuanced principles of indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge and what we mean by patents, trademarks, copyrights, and intellectual property generally, I want to just give you some examples so you have a bit of a context for the information about which I speak. So here's the first slide that I'd like to show you. This is uh, an advertisement for some uh, weight loss drug using Hootia gordoni, which is a type of plant. So to give you a little bit of background about this specific type of plant, the San, which is a group of, of, of indigenous people in South Africa, were the first to identify that Hootia gordoni had these very specific appetite suppressant properties. So it made you less hungry. So if the sun were going out on very long hunting missions or going on very, very long other types of journeys, they would consume this plant so that they would be hungry less and have to eat less. So the sun used this plant for many, many, many years, probably thousands of years or so. And then in the more recent past, in the 20th century, the South African Council for Scientific and Industrial Research decided to patent a particular strain of Hootie Gordoni, in part because they wanted to commercialize it and sell the results of, of this particular thing to a pharmaceutical company so that they could make lots of different kind of weight loss drugs and sell it to all of us in the United States and other places to convince us that we could lose weight quicker if we had this this particular drug with this particular type of appetite suppressant. So one of the things that Dr. Streifer mentioned a, a few minutes ago is that even if you do take the wild rice or take the knowledge or take those types of things, you haven't actually kept the indigenous people from doing anything. They can probably still use the rice. The sun can still use Hudio Gordoni on their missions and as appetite suppressant. So we haven't actually dispossessed them of some tangible physical piece of property. But what has happened in this particular case and in others is that that knowledge is taken and it is utilized in such a way that creates wildly, wildly profitable commercial results. So the question, at least as it relates to the, these types of bioethics questions and specifically related to plants and other types of biological knowledge is, is there something wrong with that? Is there something wrong with monetizing the knowledge that you gain from another person when that other person or community has no idea that you're going to do that type of thing with the property? So we've got these types of issues. What we see in this country especially, and by implication much of the Western world, is that almost anything can be patented. The Supreme Court in our country has even, has even gone as far to say as anything under the sun made by man can be patented. Though that's been limited in some ways, Dr. Streifer mentioned that the Patent Office recently 
said that we can't patent, a, a, well, you can't patent anything encompassing a full human being, what, what is a full human being as opposed to maybe part of a human being. So we allow patents for lots of different things. So this doesn't just apply in the bioethics realm. Another issue that's arisen and that's been wildly popular in the past couple of years are these yoga-related patents. So as we become a more holistic society, as we become way more invested in our health and in the health industry, uh, individuals who practice yoga are trying to get a slice of this health industry pie, so to speak. So classes, mats, uh, other spin-off items are becoming wildly popular as patentable uh, inventions. Last year, yoga made $6 billion alone. So this is a wildly profitable type of investment. So here's one example of a yoga patent. This is an issue patent issued in 2005, I think. So this is a method and apparatus for practicing yoga in and around trees. So literally, these two individuals, a husband and a wife, have received a patent for practicing yoga in and around things that exist in nature outside. That's one drawing, and you see there are all these different ways in which you can practice yoga in and around trees. <laughs> Another patent is this, the yoga support system and method, which encompasses special gloves and special shoes that you use to practice yoga. It helps you center better according to some of the claims of the patent, and it allows you to not slip your hands, your hands or your feet to slip as you're practicing yoga. So understandably, um, Indians, when they realized that this type of thing was happening in the United States, became very, very upset by this. Uh, many believe that yoga should not be owned or patented by anyone. One of the things Dr. Stryfer talked a lot about is this notion that some things are just sacred to certain cultures, even though we might not think that uh, wild rice should be patented or think that there's nothing wrong with patenting wild rice, others may feel differently. And so Indian culture, well, at least many in Indian culture apparently believe that yoga should not be owned and patented by anyone. Yoga has very significant spiritual significance, cultural significance, religious importance. So there were lots and lots of complaints shortly after individuals realized that these types of yoga patents were being issued in this country. So on one hand, we have patentable subject matter that perhaps is objectionable as it relates to traditional knowledge, but it's not just patentable subject matter that is possibly at issue. It can also apply to things like pictures, films, books, other types of artwork, and all those types of things that you think of when you think of like art, books, music, film, those types of things. So one recent litigation that came out of Hawaii revolved around these two images. So Hawaiian culture, as many of you probably know, has been exploited for a number of years for purposes of tourism. So in 2006, there was this lawsuit. Reese, who was a non-native Hawaiian, a, a Caucasian individual, sued a native Hawaiian for copyright infringement. So the image on the left belonged to Reese, who was the non-native Hawaiian, who had filed and received a copyright for this particular image, a picture that she had taken of a Hawaiian woman in this specific pose. This pose is called Hula Kahiko. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hula Kahiko, which is a form of cultural expression and which is very, very important to Hawaiian people. So the native Hawaiian starts selling this image on the right, which is well known in the community, and the non-native Hawaiian sues for copyright infringement and sues for quite a bit of money, and also sues not just for money damages, but also for an injunction. And by injunction, I mean basically saying you can't sell this picture anymore in your store. And so there was a major uproar in the Hawaiian community about this because it has such a, a culturally significant relevance. Ultimately, what happened in that case is that the district court said you can't really own a copyright in that type of thing because this is culturally significant, it's something everybody knows about, and it's something that has been around for a very long time. So at first blush, this seems like a good thing, right? The court says you can't sue for copyright infringement for this specific thing. You, non-native Hawaiian, do not own that image or do not own uh, intellectual property rights in this specific expression. But does that harm the Hawaiians in some way? Do native cultural or do native Hawaiians have some kind of property interest in this cultural expression that they've created and developed over a period of time? And then finally, one more example that I really like. I lived in New Orleans before I moved here. I don't know, has anybody ever been to a Mardi Gras? 
a couple of you have been to Mardi Gras. So maybe you've seen this group. These are called the Mardi Gras Indians. And it's a group of 50 or 60 different tribes. And these are individuals who are descendants of African American slaves and Native Americans. And essentially what happened was these African American slaves would run away from their masters in Louisiana and they would be given refuge on Native American uh, tribal lands. And so, of course, over time they started to uh, get married and have children and these individuals are their descendants. And so every year as part of the Mardi Gras season and Mardi Gras celebration, these individuals spend all year creating these very, very elaborate, I don't even want to call them costumes because there's something quite different from costumes. But they include uh, stories about their history. They include these very specific colors. These groups create songs that are not written, not recorded in any manner, but are secret and very, very specific and personal to them. So what happens is they, they call it parading or masking during the Mardi Gras season. And what happened for probably about 100 years or so was that literally at the end of Mardi Gras season, they would burn them and start completely over because it was so sacred and spiritual to them. They wanted to create something brand new uh, for their ancestors each and every year. So I've got a few images of these, and these are important for you to see because you see how large they are, how elaborate they are, and how important these things must be to these members of a community if they burn them after spending an entire year spending thousands upon thousands of dollars creating these types of costumes. Even the children get in on it. The children, they all, have, uh, they all have roles within the community. They all have very specific things they have to do during the season. And this is really, really actually quite a serious uh, cultural celebration that happens in New Orleans every year. So one of the problems that the Mardi Gras Indians have faced here recently is that what we say in this country, at least for many, many years, the law has been that these types of costumes aren't protectable as a matter of copyright law. And so if they're not protectable as a matter of copyright law, that might have some ramifications as it relates to whether or not at some point if they want to do something additional or different with these costumes, whether and how they can do those things. The other issue is that many of us who have been to New Orleans for Mardi Gras take pictures, take videos. So what would happen is people would come down, take pictures, take videos. Those types of things are protectable as a matter of copyright. So the suit itself is not copyrightable, but the picture you take, the image you take, if you record the songs that you hear these individuals singing, those are protectable as a matter of copyright, perhaps. So lots of people were making money off of these images, off of these videos of the Mardi Gras Indians. So I show you these examples basically to illustrate to you what traditional knowledge encompasses. So when I say traditional knowledge, what I mean is heritage, cultural expression, all of these things that have been used not just for purposes of medicine or for purposes of therapy or improving or sustaining biodiversity in the case of wild rice, but all kinds of things performing arts, visual designs, anything that really makes life better for human beings. So if I'm talking about traditional knowledge, ultimately the question is, can this traditional knowledge be protectable in some way? And am I even referring to it appropriately and calling it traditional knowledge? So I'll use the term traditional knowledge just for sake the sake of consistency, though I do think, and I'll talk about in a couple minutes, why that might not even be the appropriate term. So for many, when you look at these types of images and you hear these types of stories, something about it just doesn't feel right or it doesn't feel ethical that individuals can't control the way in which information they have created or cultivated over a number of years can be used. Traditionally, like I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, our domestic law hasn't really protected this type of information. And if something doesn't really feel right and there's no law out there that traditionally seems to protect it, the, the natural progression is for some people to say, wait a minute, can we do something about this kind of thing? Um, and as these types of situations prevent themse uh, present themselves, the question of exploitation becomes more and more prevalent, especially as intellectual property becomes so, so wildly financially successful. 
So this type of activity, taking images of, of um, suits and, and, and music, or taking the knowledge created by the sign or other individuals, really has been compared to theft or piracy, where you take something that doesn't belong to you and do something with it that benefits you. This information is highly, highly valuable. I did a little research over, over well, this morning, and about two this morning, <laughs> and learned that in the past five years, no, excuse me, in the year 2008 alone, the United States has exported almost a trillion dollars of goods related to intellectual property. So when there's almost a trillion dollars per year at stake in exports, it really becomes important to deal with these types of issues. So as a result, if we're talking about something about this just not really feeling right, and is there some kind of way in which we can protect this type of traditional knowledge? There, there are really two broad questions that have, well, there are many questions, but two broad questions that have been asked in terms of what we as a global society and a domestic society can do in response. So much of the early conversation focused on the why. Why do we even care if someone's taking a picture of a Mardi Gras Indian in New Orleans, if someone's taking information from the sun in South Africa? Though the question really has moved from why to how. If traditionally we haven't thought about intellectual property or other types of property in this way, how do we either make this type of information fit within the, our current intellectual property norms or how do we change it in some way so that it can? So you find that most people will agree, yes, we should protect this type of traditional knowledge. You've got, we've got the UN, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, WIPO, a number of different organizations saying we must do something as it relates to traditional knowledge. But the question is really how, how do we even start? How do we go about doing these types of things? So ideally, one of the points that Dr. Streifer mentioned was that we really need some kind of coherent standard, some kind of integrated instrument that we all can look to that creates legally binding mechanisms, ways in which we can enforce and protect these types of things in some way. So my, my presentation really focuses on the, on the how. How do we protect this type of information and can we do it through traditional intellectual property standards? Though I think ultimately the answer to that question it's probably not, though some of you may disagree, and we can talk about that in a couple minutes. I'll try not to speak more than about 40 minutes or so. So one of the ways that protection has been mentioned is through intellectual property, which broadly encompasses patents, copyrights, and trademarks with some other kind of nuanced things within there. And IP protection is desirable because it gives you a private right that no other body of law really does in the same way. Dr. Streifer also mentioned that you get this really broad right to exclude. You can keep everybody else from doing certain things with your creation, your invention, your work, or, or whatever. Though there are some, some serious issues with intellectual property. So I think when I say patents or, or copyright or something, most of you think of maybe like a document with a seal on it for some very complicated kind of machine or something. So let me step back and just explain a little bit about intellectual property before we get into traditional knowledge. So in this country, anyway, and I'll explain to you why I'm starting with American intellectual property law, but in this country, we incentivize the creation of writings and discoveries as a matter of constitutional law. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution, which is here on the screen, empowers Congress to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by giving inventors something for their invention giving authors something for their writings. So we give you, if you create something new and great that promotes the progress of science and the useful arts, uh, something. And that something usually is this broad right to exclude everybody else from doing certain things with your invention. Though the requirements are pretty specific and the requirements are where we get into trouble as it relates to traditional knowledge. So if generally you think, Yes, somebody created a really nice uh, costume or something maybe more involved in a costume. Yes, the sign have taken a plant and created something new or invented something new, found something new out about that plant through their knowledge. But does it meet the requirements of patent law or copyright law or trademark law or other types of intellectual property law? So if we first talk about patent law, patent law basically has three requirements with some addition. 
So just at a very, very um, kind of basic level, an invention has to be new, it has to be useful or have some utility, and it has to be non-obvious to receive patent protection. So what do those things mean? If something has to be new, useful, and non-obvious, what does all it mean? So just in about a couple seconds, let me just tell you that novelty and newness are essentially synonymous, though something doesn't have to be brand new, meaning you, no one on the planet has ever thought of it. There's some really nuanced principles relating to what newness actually means, but it's got to be new or novel. It has to be useful, so the public has to have some use for it. It has to be minimally operable for a known use. So if you invent a time machine, that's wonderful, but can we actually use it? Can you actually create a time machine that works? Does it have the utility that you claim it actually has? Probably not, though if you do create the time machine, then you are doing really well. So you've got a <laughs> new requirement, the utility requirement, and then it's got to be non-obvious. So when I say non-obvious, what does non-obvious mean? And non-obviousness essentially means that you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that it has not, it must not be obvious to anyone having ordinary skill in the art. So if you create a medical invention, it can't be obvious to doctors that this particular thing was the next logical step in 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 practice. If you create a new type of machine. It has to be non-obvious to individuals who work with those various types of machines. So if you meet these three requirements, and it's something that the Patent Act has said, yes, we protect these types of things, like processes, machines, articles of manufacture, systems, et cetera, et cetera, compositions of matter, then you get patent protection. And the really good thing about patent protection is that you get 20 years. You get 20 years to keep everybody else from using your invention, from making your invention, from selling your invention. And that can be really important for individuals who want to make money or license their inventions in some way. So patent law in and of itself seems pretty good. It seems like it might help traditional knowledge holders in some way. They have some amount of time where they can uh, monetize their invention if that's what they want to do or keep other people from using it. Though there's some issues with that as well that I'll talk about in a second. But if we just keep talking a little bit about the background of intellectual property, another, um, another type of intellectual property that might be useful as it relates to some of the things I'll talk about today is copyright. And so copyright law protects original works of authorship that have been fixed in some tangible medium of expression such that they can be perceived for more than a transitory duration. So what does all that mean? So originality basically means that you have independently created a work and that it meets the minimal level of creativity. So you can't just draw a squiggly line on a piece of paper, though maybe you could make an argument that that's creative in some way. But it's got to be original, it has to be a work of authorship, and a work of authorship is outlined in the Copyright Act. The Copyright Act tells us these things are considered works of authorship, though this list isn't exhaustive, and if you can make really good arguments that something else can be protected, maybe we as the government will also protect those things. The problem with the Mardi Gras Indians and their costumes is that costumes have historically not fallen within the work of authorship requirements outlined in the Copyright Act. So it's got to be a work of authorship, and that's where we run into a lot of issues. And then it also has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So what does that mean? Fixation essentially requires that we all can see it, perceive it, read it, or in some kind of way, visualize or hear the, the work of authorship that is original. So another issue that we have with traditional knowledge is this concept of passing things down by word of mouth such that the information is not fixed. And if the information isn't fixed, then it can't really meet the, the basic requirements of copyright protection. So if we've got patent law and copyright law and those types of things give individuals this right to exclude, Copyright law, at least as a matter of international law, gives you uh, the right to exclude for the entire life of the creator plus 50 years in most instances in, in our country at 70 years. So you get a really long time to keep everybody else from using your work in a way that you don't want them to. So what are the problems with this kind of system? If it seems pretty good, it's been working for us for a number of years. What are the issues? And the first issue is that this is our system. 
This is a Western system, this is Western society, and we might feel a certain way about things, but not everybody feels the same way we do about uh, intellectual property, about property, about ownership, and all those kinds of things. And debates about IP in this country, intellectual property in this country, tend to center around money. I've been talking a lot about money. I mean, I like money, I think a lot of people <laughs> like money. So in our country, intellectual property usually revolves around this economic value concept. Though traditional knowledge, by contrast, usually isn't so much about money. It might be about history, it might be about culture, it could be any number of things. And then we have this ugly history of colonization in most countries, and that also comes up as part of the discussion. Hey, America, hey, Europe, you can no longer tell us what to do with our property rights. So some critics compare Western IP to imperialism, and maybe it kind of is in some way. So Western beliefs don't take into consideration a lot of the different cultural components that, that other societies or other cultures might in, in, in many ways. So if we have this history of colonialism, this history of imperialism, and it's disempowered so many people, understandably, when we want to impose these types of standards on others, it'll be met with a lot of resistance, especially if we say, as I think we probably have, okay, so you can use our intellectual property system, but nothing you've ever created applies, let's start today. And so that is really one of the huge problems with, with this type of, of system. So if we have these compatibility issues, is there some kind of way that we can work around these compatibility issues? And I don't know that there's a clear answer to that question. And one of the reasons there's not a clear answer to that question is something else that Dr. Streifer mentioned, and that is what do you want? What is the desired result? Is it positive legal protection where you actually get rights? Or do you want negative protection where you just don't want anybody to use your traditional knowledge now or, or ever? So let me talk a little bit more about the differences between negative protection and positive. So negative legal, legal protection prevents outsiders from using traditional knowledge, regardless of compensation. Even if you offer a billion dollars, we're going to say no because we just fundamentally believe that this is, is wrong. There it might be spiritual reasons. There might be some other kind of sacred ritual attached to the property. They might be artifacts. So. If this artifact or property or thing, whatever this thing is, traditional knowledge, is sacred, maybe it shouldn't be owned at all. Or maybe we just don't want you, white man, or you, black man, or you, yellow man, or you, whoever, to own it. So how do we even start the discussion about what it means to have defensive or negative legal protection? And then on the other hand, some traditional knowledge groups want positive protection. They want to take place in this global, in this market. They want to get involved in the financial benefits, the monetary benefits of this type of system. I told you we made a trillion dollars five years ago. Who knows what it is now on intellectual property related um, industries. So these groups want the economic value of intellectual property protection. The San, for example, have almost died out as a community because they don't have money, don't have resources, don't have jobs and those types of things. We've seen that happen even in this country with the Native Americans living in poverty. So many cultures are dying out because they don't have financial resources. And if intellectual property is the best way to get those resources, then they want to take part in that. So as we create this system, which something does need to be done, do we create lots of mini systems for each and every community, or do we take what is perceived to be the best approach for the whole? So what kind of protection do you get? And then what's encompassed? What is encompassed in this notion of traditional knowledge or, or indigenous knowledge? And within even this very broad question, there are lots and lots of things that are really yet to be answered. So one is something that I mentioned a couple minutes ago, and that's what do we even call it? So what do we call this stuff? Is it traditional knowledge? Is it indigenous knowledge? Is it indigenous assets? Is it traditional resources? What is this stuff? So I'm using traditional knowledge for purposes of consistency, though I think the term traditional carries with it this notion of ancientness or something that happened a long time ago or something that's very rigid. And usually, traditional knowledge is very fluid. It changes over time. 
someone mentioned in their question at the end of the last session that, that the cultivation of wild rice takes place over many, many, many years. So maybe traditional knowledge isn't the best term. And so why is that important, what we call it anyway? Because as we create these new systems, these new international norms, these new international standards, if your knowledge isn't traditional, then maybe you get left out. If I'm using the term indigenous, if your information isn't indigenous, maybe you get left out. Maybe in the, I also didn't turn the ringer off on my <laughs> telephone, so I'm gonna do that right now. Um, so as we talk about whether something is indigenous, maybe with the Mardi Gras Indians, they're African American, they're not indigenous to this country. So if I'm calling this type of knowledge indigenous knowledge, maybe their knowledge gets left out of the equation. So we need to figure out what to call it in the first instance. And one of my colleagues in the back has come up with a really interesting way in which to, to define or to term this information and refer to this information. So anyway, first of all, what do we call it? And then what is included? So the ideas that I showed you at the very beginning included inventions, maybe included uh, biotechnology, included art, included dance, included song, but any type of thing could meet this traditional or indigenous knowledge definition. Maybe it's practices and learning. Over the course of 300 years, we've learned that this particular plant acts in this particular way. Maybe it's language. Maybe it's agricultural practices. Lots and lots of different things can fall within the definition. So even though this body of literature has been out for a while, many people still can't agree on the definition of what traditional knowledge encompasses. So that's a huge problem. Because again, maybe your knowledge or your innovations get left out of the discussion. So there's no real definite or universally approved definition of traditional knowledge because there's so many different vast components. And then finally, who owns it? So ownership is also something that is really kind of a Western idea, the way in which I'm talking about it and the way in which I think has been talked about earlier today. So usually traditional knowledge is generated as a community, as part of communal learning over time preserved by groups and communities. So it's distinctively associated with people, though our intellectual property system in the United States and then just generally the type of intellectual property system that we use as part of Western society focuses more on the individual. And so there's not this notion of community rights in some kind of intellectual property. So if those are at least the first questions, what do we call it and what's included? The other big question is, can it be intellectual property the way in which it's existed on this planet for so many years? So if we go back to, um, I use a Mac, but I don't, I'm just gonna, so I had this really nice slide that I didn't get to, but it's basically the East versus West, we're talking, well it's not even really the West, it's more like the West versus everybody because the West is <laughs> who basically decides what intellectual property law is, and by the West, I basically mean us, so the United States. So we get to decide what intellectual property is encompassed. We are creating all of the rules. And then uh, we've got the positive and negative protection. And then finally, let's come back to patents because I'm running out of time. I thought I would talk a lot less than this. So I'm running out of time. Here are our patent requirements. Newness, novelty, usefulness, and non-obviousness. Can traditional knowledge, in the way in which I've been discussing it, meet these requirements? And I don't think they can. I don't know that they can. Um, one of the reasons is because of the novelty component. If something's been around for 10,000 years or 1,000 years or 100 years, is it really novel? And I think there's a good argument that it is not. Um, the other component relates to something that isn't really on the diagram, but that's implicit and that's the ability to describe your invention to a person of ordinary skill in the art. And if it's never been written down, nobody's ever put it in writing, then how do we know that this has been enabled in such a way that we can explain it to an individual of ordinary skill in the art? So there's no real way, I don't think, to make it fit within this specific definition. The other problem with this notion of patent protection is the 20 year limitation. 20 years sounds like a long time, but as it relates to traditional knowledge, 
20 years is probably a drop in the bucket. If the sign had been around for 10,000 years, they were, I think some years ago, some scientists, some archaeologists found the first living or the first human skeletal remains. They were from a sign, a member of the sign tribe. The, the bones were maybe like eight or 9,000 years old. So they've been around for such a long time, and the knowledge has been around for such a long time. 20 years is not going to be much of a, uh, it's not much of an incentive to get 20 years of protection. And quite a few people who want traditional knowledge protected through these intellectual property norms don't want that time limitation. And so that there's a question about how even if we do allow some group to have patent protection for their invention, even if we do allow that, does the 20 years still apply? As it relates to copyright, so if I'm talking about works of authorship, books, maps, songs, um, artwork, images, those types of things, copyright is also problematic for a number of reasons. So a copyright is really an intellectual property right, not in the idea. So you can't get a copyright for an idea. You don't get a patent for an idea. But a copyright is a right in the original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium. So that fixation requirement, like I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, is a problem if something has been orally passed down for years to years. And then also a work of authorship, if we're talking about something that's been created by somebody, how do we know who that author is? If the author is 8,000 years old, how do we identify and prove that that is the author, it's impossible to identify <coughs> who those people are. And then the temporal limitation is also a concern like it is with patents. It's a little bit better, life of the author plus 50 or 70 years or, or something along those lines, but it's still not a long, a long time. So if we're talking about patents and intellectual property and copyrights, even if we do meet all of those requirements, there's still some other issues. So there's that temporal limitation, and then there's also the question of accessibility. Yes, you can get a patent, but hey, member of the San tribe, you go ahead and file your patent, you figure it out in this very, very complicated system. Obtaining a patent is a very uh, difficult, or can be, I've got a patent lawyer in the room who might say otherwise. The application process can be expensive for many people, it can take a long time, and it can be inaccessible for, for quite a few individuals. Copyrights, on the other hand, are easy to obtain, they're pretty cheap to get, but they're hard to enforce. How do I prove that somebody on the other side of the world is using my song? On an interesting note about the Mardi Gras Indians, so they create these songs that are passed down from generation to generation. The Dixie Chicks took some lyrics from one of their songs, won a Grammy for the album, made millions and millions of dollars, and never gave the sign any credit or excuse me, not the sign, never gave the Mardi Gras Indian tribe any credit or anything along those lines. So copyright can be difficult too for a number of different reasons. So there are all these issues related to intellectual property and traditional knowledge. The worry is also that even if we do give indigenous groups, they figure out how to get a patent application filed or file a copyright application, if they do get that exclusive monopoly, if it's for 20 years or life of the author plus 70 years or whatever, then that might enable them to drive other companies out of business because remember you get that right to exclude everybody else from using your product. And it could lead to higher prices or at least this is the argument, everything will cost more because these one group of individuals own this specific thing. And then the final thing, since I don't have a whole lot of time, one of the other big issues is this notion of, let's say it's not protectable, or let's say put the intellectual property question aside, maybe there's some other kind of way you can get credit or get money or get some benefit from this knowledge that you have given to someone else. Even if traditional knowledge can't be protected by IP, you still created something, you can still get something, and you can do that through basically contracts. I agree to pay you money regardless of whether you have a patent or a copyright. And this is traditionally called access and benefit sharing. So if one of the issues is we don't get recognized or we don't get any of the benefit, whether it's monetary or whatever, 
Then what some countries do, and there have been a number of international agreements that impose an obligation on countries or users of traditional knowledge to get prior informed consent of the use of certain types of things. Usually this relates to genetic resources. So I'm talking about genetic resources. Basically, if a party wants to use the traditional knowledge, they have to enter into an agreement, a contract where they say, um, you give us your consent and here are the things that you will get in, in return. So an example of this might be a scientist is in South America. He sees some community in the Amazon region doing a specific thing with the plant and he observes that this plant has some kind of ability to, or some kind of way in which it can, um, I don't know, heal a wound or heal a cut or something. So the scientist, now that he has information and knowledge related to this indigenous community's traditional knowledge, he can do one of maybe two things. He can do nothing and walk away from it and say, well, it's not mine, I just won't do anything with it. Or he can approach this community and say, hey, uh, can I get your consent to do X, Y, Z with this knowledge? And there are a number of different international guidelines that outline the way in which you do this, the way in which you make this happen. So the example with the sign that I mentioned earlier, something like this actually happened. Once the sign learned that the CSIR was planning on patenting this um, a particular strain of the hoodia plant, they went to them and negotiated essentially a contract where they got royalties off of the sale of these products. So it's been criticized for many reasons, one being which the sign haven't gotten a lot of money out of the deal and the other, so there are lots of criticisms, but there, there are questions about um, negotiating power, bargaining power, when you have Pfizer and an indigenous group somewhere negotiating a deal. So there have been a number of different international agreements that have tried to rectify that problem, one of which is called the Nagoya Protocol, which is the most recent. Basically, that builds upon a much larger agreement related to biological diversity and it requires a prior informed consent and gives very, very specific requirements. So you have to inform the community how the resource is going to be used, how the knowledge is going to be used, what it means when you say you're going to use it, what the financial implications are, what the risks are of using this specific type of, uh, of product. So this is important, I think, because now we're kind of moving in the right direction, even if intellectual property doesn't apply or if we're trying to figure out the kinks in this intellectual property system, the, the local communities, the indigenous communities can share in the benefits and the resources that have been used. So there are really three obligations as outlined in the Nagoya Protocol, access, benefit sharing, and compliance. So how do you go to these tribes? Can Pfizer send a very slick, sophisticated lawyer in and negotiate? Do they have to go through the government? There are some protection, protective measures in place, establishing clear rules for what it means to get prior informed consent, um, what it means to get these types of things in writing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, with, as it relates to benefit sharing, what it means to get the benefit. Is it monetary? Is it we will teach you also how to use these resources the way in which we're going to use them? And then finally, compliance. How do you make sure that people are following the terms of the deal? If I sign and say I'm going to give you these things or do these things, how do we ensure that the parties are actually doing the things that they've agreed to do? And the Nagoya Protocol outlines ways in which uh, individuals and communities and countries can do that, though it hasn't actually entered into force yet. If and when it does, those types of protective measures help. So a related issue, if we're talking now about prior informed consent, is who gives consent? Is it one guy in the tribe? Is it the chief? Is it a group? Um, is it like a board of directors? Is it who gives the consent to some other entity? So that actually is a pretty big question for a number of reasons. One goes back to this whole notion of property ownership. Who actually owns it in such a way that they can say, I first of all created it, the traditional knowledge originated with me or with my group, and then the other who actually speaks for the group. So there are very, very nuanced principles that affect the way in which we think about traditional knowledge and protecting these groups. From, um, from exploitation or from unwanted exploitation. 
And there have been a number of different solutions proposed, though it's about 40 minutes, so I think I'll stop there and take questions, I think. So, all right. Thank you very much. Once again, I am going to let you uh, field your own questions, if okay. that's okay. But I'll, I'll start with one. Um, so uh, you've raised a number of issues that are associated with the problem of allocating traditional knowledge rights to the communities in which the traditional knowledge originates. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, I mean, one of them is the issue of who gives, uh, who gives consent. But another important issue is the issue of how the benefits get distributed mm -hmm. and how the group itself is defined. Mm -hmm. um, when I think of, for example, Native American groups who have an interest in wild rice, um, there is, I mean, there, there is a definite coherent community mm -hmm. there of people who have that interest. But then there are also people who are related to that community in, in various degrees and in various ways. Mm -hmm. And there's a question of how, you know, at what point, I mean, all, human, all groups of human beings are, are vague in certain respects, at least, or I don't know, most, most of them are. That may be universal generalizations bother me the minute they come out of my mouth. <laughs> but I mean, I do think that this is true, at least of the, of the Ojibwa, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there are people who are related in varying degrees to that group. And it would be difficult to assign some kind of intellectual property regime mm -hmm. Uh, over to a group of people like that mm -hmm. and, and to determine who gets those benefits. So are there ways that might be developed to approach that problem? Yeah, so one country, India, has done something pretty interesting, I think, and they take a pr an approach similar to the Ojibwa in that they don't really want anybody to own this type of traditional knowledge because it's sacred or because property ownership just means something different. And what India has done is created something called the Traditional Knowledge Digital Library, where they essentially get all the groups to come to a specific place or they get this information and put it on the internet in this digital library. And essentially what that does without getting really detailed as it relates to patent requirements is that, or it really, it, it, it gets rid of that new requirement, that requirement of novelty. If something already exists, that means that it is prior art. So if something is prior art, it's not necessary. The, the, the information that's based on the traditional knowledge might not be new in all respects, so that digital library at least puts the information out there so that it can preclude patents that are based on that traditional knowledge from issuing in some instances. Some other countries, so you ask who gets the benefit if there is some kind of monetary benefit. What some countries do is say, if you're applying for a patent, you have to tell us whether it's based on traditional knowledge, if so, where you got it from, who you talk to, and any royalties that you receive from the uh, commoditization of that patent goes into a fund, a traditional knowledge fund or an indigenous people fund or something. And how the money gets distributed, I, I don't know. Um, Another program that's pretty interesting is in Costa Rica, where if a company wants to come in and use genetic resources, they essentially go through the government, they file some kind of document, and in exchange for taking that traditional knowledge from the community, they also have to employ members of the tribe or the community. They have to teach them various scientific principles. Some money goes towards education, so the money actually is put back into the community to create schools or roads or educational systems in some way. Uh, hello, yeah. Um, I've been noticing that um, a large part of this debate is trying to figure out how traditional knowledge kind of fits within the intellectual property realm. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of curious, um, and not with the logistics notwithstanding, would it be more appropriate to perhaps develop a a different system that would incorporate, that's designed for traditional knowledge. I know that there's like, the PVPA is, was developed early on as a kind of a hybrid to try to account for plant variety and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, would it be more, um, would it be better to try to develop a different system that would handle traditional rights or do we keep trying to redefine what intellectual property rights are and what traditional knowledge are to try to fit them into what's already existing? Um. Yes, 
the answer to your, yes, it would be, it would make much more sense that the term is, is sui generis, creating a sui generis type of regime or form of protection. And yes, that makes a lot more sense. And so what some countries have done, so there are really two debates kind of going on. One is domestic. So each country can do whatever it wants to do, theoretically, unless they've signed some kind of international agreement. So there's a domestic discussion and then there's an international discussion. And if you've agreed to some kind of trade agreement or some, there's the, trade, the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property or any number of different agreements, unless you've agreed to some international standard. So what some countries have said is we're not gonna wait for this international debate to finish. We're still talking about what do we even call it. So they've created their own kind of sui generis forms or ways in which they can protect traditional knowledge. China, for example, has a system where you uh, disclose the traditional knowledge, but you can get something like patent protection for new and new improvements on that traditional knowledge system or on that information. Um, other countries have done things where traditional knowledge is protected in some way and require, I think I mentioned a couple minutes ago, require royalties to be paid. So yes, it would be wonderful if we could get an international system in place, though I think agreeing on all the terms would be really, really difficult. Yeah. By and large, the discussion has to do with uh, a broader thing in humanity is people are willing to take advantage of others mm -hmm. if they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. And the system that's being used, a patent system, the legal system, was created by, in large part, the Western world mm -hmm. system. It's been created by the elite Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. The top 4% of those society created this legal system that we now use to uh, justify patenting things. Um, and this uh, diagram up here, I was going to ask you to bring it up if you hadn't, but you've done a good job of bringing it up before I even requested it. But the non-obvious part stands out to me. Um, patenting the plant in Africa that tribal people used, that benefits and the plant itself was very obvious to those people. The use of uh, BT, for example, mm -hmm. for uh, controlling worms in um, like my broccoli plants, I used that for many years before the use of BT and corn was patented. It was very obvious to me and other people who've used it for many years, the benefits of this. So using those three requirements to patent something that does not meet the requirement, there's one thing left out. It was obvious to me and other people so how could it even be patented in the first place? How could the plant in Africa even be considered for being patented? So if I had the answer to that question, I'd be a very wealthy woman, but I will give it, I'll give it a shot. So, so I think you are right that obviousness seems to be almost left out of the equation in, in some instances. Um, if the standard and there are different standards in every country, really. But if, if we presume the standard is non-obvious to a person of ordinary skill in the art and the way in which we interpret that, I think that you make some good arguments in that regard. And, and I think generally what happens, though, now I'm going to punt to the patent lawyer who can talk more about the non-obviousness requirement. I, I think you can make very creative arguments to the government and with the patent office regarding why something like this isn't non-obvious. And so one of the issues with patenting traditional knowledge, if I can just take a step back and talk a little bit more broadly, is what you're actually patenting. So the patent isn't for the plant. The patent is for some company isolating a strain of, uh, or, or some kind of, um, Yes, I have a bioengineering degree, but now I can't remember the biology terms. So if, you, if you're patenting, if you're taking an isolated component of a patent, of, of a plant and patenting that, then maybe yes, using the plant itself is obvious, but if you're isolating specific strains and doing things to it in a laboratory and changing it so that it's not something that's occurring naturally in nature and doing something very specific with it, then maybe the non-obviousness requirement uh, is a bit more lax in that regard though I'm going to have to deflect to my patent lawyer. I think that's still a stretch so they can get the uh, benefits from uh, the product and then make it say they can, well, we can use it now because we've done this to it, but 
they, the companies all the time use uh, material that's in the public domain and then tweak it some way or another and then say, well, now we have the right to use it for our benefit when the public has put a great deal of money and effort and expertise into the whole process and they don't necessarily relieve the, or gain a large share of benefit from it. Mm -hmm. I agree with you and I think farmers in Iowa are, are specifically or particularly vested in that type of argument when they've been planting and using seeds for a number of years and then maybe a Monsanto or some other large company comes and patents the specific thing that they've been doing for many years. Um, though I think it, it's, it's pretty complex. Yeah. That was true. Going back to um, the question prior to that one, so you mentioned the possibility of a sweet generous system to handle some of these concerns, but my guess would be, and I'd like you to speak to this, is that people who are upset about the kinds of issues that we've been talking about are also unhappy with certain powers that are given in the patent system, and so they are not going to be happy with an additional system as long as the patent system stays in its existing state. So can you think through what the um, possible changes might be that people would want in the patent system? Changes to our patent system that right. would encompass traditional knowledge or? So the, the American patent system, and maybe you can give me a little bit more in terms of your question, but so, so we've had some. So think about, for example, the patent right of somebody who has a patent on a genetically engineered crop mm -hmm. to sue for patent infringement uh, when it's found out that they're growing those seeds on their property, even if it's without their knowledge. And that's something that many people find objectionable. And it's not going to be solved by a sui generis system. It's a sort of it's one of the rights that's conferred by the patent system, and people think that right is too broad. Right, and so we've got these changes to the Patent Act now, the American Invents Act of September of last year, which um, revises or modifies our patent system in, in some way, though I think your question doesn't so much relate to traditional knowledge, but just we're unhappy with the way in which patent laws have been enforced. And I think, I'm not anti-Monsanto necessarily, but Monsanto is notorious for suing farmers when seeds are cross-pollinated or go over into their fields through wind or other mechanisms. And like you mentioned, the patent system is really kind of like an all or nothing. It's not, there's no such thing really as accidental infringement. If you're liable, then you're actually liable. So a sui generis regime, I think, is a little different because the proponents of a sui generis regime want something. So. It's not that they want more because the patent system isn't giving them anything. They want something a little bit different that takes their thoughts or their, inf their information, their knowledge into consideration. But I think reform to the patent system is a little bit of a different type of, of question, though I think some of the later speakers can probably speak more to that than I could. Yeah. I, for one, have really enjoyed this, but there's only a minute left on the tape, oh. and I really think she deserves an applause. <laughs> okay.